Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. We're teaching on knowing the Father. And in this series, we've been showing how that we come to know God as Father through Jesus Christ, His Son. God the Father took initiative in reaching our lives. There is no way without His revelation that we could ever even discover who God was, what He was like, what He was thinking about us, and how much He loved us. That's why in Christian teaching, revelation is so important. It speaks about God the Father taking initiative in revealing Himself so that we wouldn't have to guess what God is like. We wouldn't have to guess which is the way of salvation, whether it's this way or that way. No, God has come in the person of His Son and shown us the way, and His name is Jesus. Some Christians throughout the centuries have discussed this and wondered just where the human will is involved with the divine will. I think the answer is very simple and directly taught in Scripture. God takes the initiative, His will comes first, and we respond. But when we respond, we can only respond by His grace. It's the attraction of the cross. It's the drawing power of the Holy Spirit that convinces us that we're sinners, that we need God. It's the revelation of the Spirit of God that flows from the heart of the Father concerning the identity of the Son, by which we say, yes, I know who you are. You are the Christ, and you are the Son of the living God. Only the Holy Spirit can reveal this to you. So today, when you hear the teaching of God's Word through these broadcasts and these programs, you will realize that it is only God's gift that you can receive. You can't offer yourself to God and say, I will earn my way into your love. God's love is unconditional. It means that when He sets His love upon you, He moves in your heart by His Holy Spirit to create an openness to the teaching of the Scripture that you might say, yes, I see Him too. I now see Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. And the same Holy Spirit flowing from the Father's initiative into your life will draw you closer and closer to Him. And when this happens, you will get to know God for who He really is. He is your loving Father who loves you through His Son. So, the idea is if we fulfill the conditions, He'll pour out His blessing. But if we don't, if we don't, He won't. In this way of thinking, the human will has priority, not the Father's will. Don't think that I'm saying the human, human will is not involved, that we don't have to respond, that we don't have to fulfill conditions. But we don't respond in order to make God do something. We respond because God has first acted. That's what responding is all about. I put it this way, it's probably more accurate theologically than it is semantically. Our responsibility is to respond to His ability. Quite simply, you and every other believer must decide for yourself whether you believe the divine order is grace, then obedience, or obedience, then grace. Whichever approach we choose, we then rigorously apply our choice to every aspect of faith. We don't begin by grace and end up in works. It should be obvious that not just in this teaching on knowing the Father, but in every one of these Sword of the Spirit teachings, I've sought to show you that the Father's will has priority, that grace is either always first and foremost, or it ceases to be grace at all. That's God's faith. 
the Spirit's anointing, the gifts and the ministry of the Spirit. These are all given essentially in the context of the Father's free and lavish grace. And any divine conditions, and there are conditions, like for example, gospel obedience, these conditions are our grateful response to grace. They're not the requirements or preconditions for grace. Now, the difficulty that we face today that, is that in large parts of Pentecostalism and charismatic evangelicalism, grace appears only in the beginning, in conversion. And we seem to forget it in the other aspects of Christian life. So it's still first, you've got to do this and then God will bless you. You are blessed in your doing, not because of your doing. This is infinite grace. It goes on and on. We begin by grace in faith, and we continue by grace in faith, and we're completed by grace in faith. It's grace from first to last, and therefore faith from first to last. Obedience, then grace, sadly, is at the heart of much contemporary teaching today. This means that those of us who are hungry for revival and renewal are encouraged to turn to techniques to bring it about, systems or methods, instead of reveling in God's free, unconditional grace and looking to Him to fulfill His free, unconditional promise in our lives. If we believe that the Father's will has priority in all things, then that His grace is infinite and absolute, we will turn to Him if we're spiritually hungry. Yes, we will. But if we believe that our will has priority, and if it's obedience, then grace, if that's the order, we will turn not to Him, but to the latest methods, the latest books, the latest videos, the latest gimmicks that are happening in charismatic circles which, according to the latest teacher, we are, are guaranteed to bring us the same blessing they've got if we follow that carefully. We should ask ourselves, what kind of father do we have? Is he a slot machine father? Like you pick up on those, on those railway stations, a slot machine. You put in your money and the chocolate comes out. Or not, as the case may be. <laughs> and you end up having to kick the machine to try and get your money back or your chocolate. And you'd settle for either because you're dealing with a machine and a faulty machine. We're not dealing with a machine. We're dealing with the ever-living, ever-loving, all-embracing, grace-providing God who loves us personally and intimately. He's not a machine. We're in relationship with Him. We should ask ourselves, what kind of father do we have? Is he the Yahweh Elohim whom we've been looking at throughout this Knowing the Father series? Is he the all-powerful, all-protecting, all-perfect, all-providing God whose great passion is our redemption? Is he the one who has suffered the infinite grief of love, who has revealed his eternal love by giving his only Son for us, who keeps on coming to us in the Son and the Spirit, who delights to give us good things? Is that the God with whom you're in relationship? Or is he the one who has told us that he's tossed all these blessings on the table and you've got to come and get it and help yourself and work out which is the best method and technique in all the impossible, all the, of all the, in the impossible maze of, of these right and wrong approaches. The question is, how are God's promises fulfilled? And this is one of the most burning questions that believers need to answer. How are God's promises fulfilled? We've got to decide whether God's promises are fulfilled by us as we work through a list of conditions and then perform actions which match them. And I suggest to you that people's attitude and much preaching today comes very close to that. And if I asked you that question in the beginning, you might have said, yes, of course we must work through a list of conditions and then fulfill those conditions as actions. 
in order for God to bless us. But that is not the truth of Abba-focused living. Are God's promises not rather fulfilled by the Father in His grace, leading us step by step towards receiving these promises in His way and in His time? And the difference between those two things is the difference between knowing God as Father, as Abba, personally and intimately, and just somehow knowing that somehow, somewhere, God wants to bless you, and, and you've got to make sure that you understand how to go about it to get those blessings. In our desire as preachers to be practical, how to live under the blessing of God, how to receive healing, how to experience God's provision and prosperity. At times we've left the impression that it is a simple matter of having been accepted by grace, now we are blessed by works. If we're convinced that it's the Father who fulfills His promise by leading us into them, we will never follow a method or a formula. Instead, we'll follow the Father. We'll watch what He's doing. We'll follow the way He's taking. That's what Jesus meant when He says in Luke 11, verse 13, Your heavenly Father is willing to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. Two main elements to this verse. Number one, the Father's willingness and our asking. We can relate these two elements together in two very different ways. First of all, we can say the Father's willingness depends on our asking. He is willing if we ask. If we don't ask, He's not willing. Or we can say our asking comes from the Father's willingness to give. It's only because He is willing that we dare ask. That's what Jesus says, ask and you shall receive. You don't have because you don't ask. He is more willing to give than you are even to ask. God is able to do infinitely, exceedingly, above and beyond anything that you ask or think or imagine. That's the invitation. God is willing. The answer is yes. What's the question? Come on, ask me a question so that I can have you hear me say yes. It's only because He is willing that we dare to ask. It's the power of His Word at work in us which gives us the power to ask Him. We looked at that in Living Faith, especially part four. It's a very strong section there. This means that the Spirit is not merely the gift who comes at the end of our asking. He is also there at the beginning. He is the creator of our desire to ask. He is the strength behind our asking and seeking. He is the boldness in our coming and approaching God, and so on, and so on. It is God by His Spirit who is leading us through this whole process. Remember, there is real human asking in both these approaches. In the first, it's before God's will and as a condition of God's willingness to give. But in the second, it's the result and outworking of God's willingness to give. The difference between those two things is the difference between knowing God intimately and forever living on the periphery of His, of your circumstances, or living on the periphery of His goodness, and thinking that you must be somehow a servant that first of all must do rather than being a son who first of all exists in relationship to Abba Father. Now believers who apply the wrong approach here think 
in salvation that repentance is the condition of grace. That they turn to God in order to receive His forgiveness. Whereas those who apply the second approach, the right approach, believe that repentance is the result of grace and that we turn to Him because He has already forgiven us by His grace and mercy. We're back to the prodigal son. When was he reconciled? In the far country? On the way home? As he got home? That wasn't repentance. That was him doing the best he could to get out of his difficult circumstances. He only repented in the Father's arms. And it was the Father's love and acceptance and unconditional forgiveness that worked repentance in him in its fullest extent. Not just repentance as a change of mind, but a complete turnabout of life. And those who, who favor the first approach, which is, first of all we ask, and then God is willing, will seek, seek for spiritual renewal and revival and work hard at their prayer lives, believing that it's their purity, it's their response, it's their obedience that will bring revival. This comes dangerously close to self-effort. But those who will live in the Father's presence in this Abba relationship will, and who believe that the Father first comes in His grace and then begins by His Spirit to renew us step by step by faith and purity and by prayer. We will recognize that it, these things are the signs of God's grace in us. Isaiah 64 there is no one who stirs himself up to lay hold of you, for our iniquities are many. This is not that he forces his things upon us as some caricature of this approach. Rather, it's that he gives us a new freedom and so that we are ready and able to receive God's goodness and God's blessings. So the Father's will is paramount. It comes first. It overrides everything. It is the controlling factor of the universe. Now there are many leaders who insist that there must be some human initiative either in the realization or appropriation of salvation or in the maintaining of salvation. So somehow you are saved by faith but you have to you are kept by works. Well, we should recognize how strongly Ephesians 1 makes it absolutely clear that the initiative is entirely with the Father. John, Ephesians 1, verses 1, 4 to 6, just as He chose us. That's strange. Most people are talking about, you're a Christian because you've said yes to Jesus. God had to first say yes to you before you could even say yes to Him. Just as He chose us in Him. When? When we accepted Christ? Before the foundation of the world. Why? That we should be holy and without blame before Him, him in love. So it's not just our salvation and our forgiveness that comes by His grace and His call, but our holiness and our perfection and our glorification. These are part of the same unconditional, gracious promise and provision of God. Salvation is all of God. The initiative is entirely the Father's. Verse 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His what? Of His what? Of His what? No, read this verse. Of His grace. Oh, you were just letting me read it out. You hadn't turned to it. 
to the praise and the glory of the glory of his grace his grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved it's God's grace that makes us accepted in Christ now of course many preachers are concerned to challenge people to respond to the gospel and that's right and the assumption however behind their challenge can be the idea that fallen people are capable of making a positive response when we challenge people to respond we are challenging the dead to rise it's a paradox but when we challenge those who are dead in trespasses and sins to believe in Jesus, we are speaking to the dead. But God, the Holy Spirit, can enter the, by his power the words of the gospel that carry life. And the dead hear the voice of the Son of God and from their graves rise by his grace and say, Yes, I will follow you. That's why Ezekiel was given his preaching practice in a graveyard rather like most churches today. Well, no, not most. <laughs> Just teasing. When you preach the gospel, you stand as Jesus before the tomb of Lazarus and say, come forth. It's not because Lazarus in his dead condition has the capacity to hear you and to respond but it's the life-giving word of the gospel by the grace of God that brings light and life to those whom he has chosen for himself. Ephesians 2 verses 1 to 5 make this very, very clear. And you he made alive, he made alive. You didn't bring yourself to life. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, which and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So that fallen people have no capability at all unless God restores it to them in Christ and creates it in them by the Spirit. That this fact is taught in the Scriptures should settle the argument forever. It's grace first, then obedience. For those who affirm the order of obedience, then grace, must therefore be considering that believers make a significant contribution to salvation and blessing by fulfilling the conditions and deciding to believe the promise. But Ephesians 2 goes on to say, verses 8 and 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So what we have here is the gift of faith, living faith, saving faith. That blesses us. And as a result of this, there's no room for any smugness or boasting when we finally appreciate the absolute priority of the Father's will and the eternal and infinite extent of His grace. The most we can do is to recite Ephesians 2 verse 10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, of course, we walk in the Spirit in partnership with the Holy Spirit as we teach in the rule of God, as we teach in the living faith and in knowing the Spirit. But we're only able to do this as the Holy Spirit works in us. Many churches today are longing for renewal and revival. But there will come 
to us renewal and revival when we despair of our competence, when we stop our striving, when we realize we have no power to fulfill anything of ourselves, and when we turn to the Father to see what He wills to do by His grace, and then when we wait obediently for Him to lead us into His promises. The gracious will of the Father is the only originating source of all blessings, and everything in our faith stems from this grace. But we should not forget that His free and infinite grace calls us to respond to the Father with grateful, unconditional, Gethsemane, Abba-facing, Father-facing obedience. Grace, then obedience, surely is the only route to freedom, the glorious freedom of the sons and daughters of our Father. And that must be for us the heart of what God wants to say to us in this course of teaching on knowing the Father. The absence of striving, total dependence, total trust, and unflinching, 100% yielded, Father-facing obedience. Abba, Father, not my will, but your will be done. That's the end of this session, and we come back for the final session where we're going to cover the last two sections in the manuals, how we can move on to enjoy this relationship with our Father in prayer and stand as His sons and daughters in the world today. So God bless you. Till the next time.